are so many acronyms in our business. EFL, ELT, ELF. So why GPS? Well, I think, it, I think it's because it's, on the way here, I created another acronym. And it's the acronym for a, it's, uh, let me tell you what it is. It's the AFWA. You know what that stands for? No. Can you guess? It's the acronym for, a, for Acronym Free World Association. <laughs> This talk is on motivation, and um, I'm going to ask you to do a few things, okay? Uh, uh, but it's generally, I, I think, you know, I may, I may need to give you a food for thought, and then uh, perhaps we can, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, your comments at the end with the help. Why motivation? Well, because if you look at the, all these successful case studies in, uh, in second language acquisition, all the most successful students, you know, people, you know, taught themselves English, okay, um, without going to school. You will see, you know, that they have several things that differ, but they have one thing that's common. The thing that they have in common is the degree of motivation. So it seems to me, you know, that without trying to sound too dogmatic, to a certain extent, motivation, that, that fire that, that, either, that either burns inside or doesn't, okay, that fire inside, to a certain extent, is as important as methodology, if not more. Um, what, what, what's motivation? Motivation is why we do what we do. And the etymology is Latin. Okay? It comes from movement, motum in, in Latin. It's interesting. Okay? So it's what moves you. It's what makes you do what you do. As a, as a language teacher, as a teacher trainer, I'm interested you know, in, uh, in how people, in what makes people click. And I'm sure you know you are too. Okay? So if you don't know who your people are, if you don't know what they're interested in, if you don't know what moves them, Whatever you do in class, it's not bound to make an impact on them. And so, this is where my interest in motivation uh, comes from. And I'm going to tell you a little story. I have a son in Paris. Well, I have a son everywhere we go. But, but <laughs> we, live, we live in Paris. He's 13 years old. Now, Lindsay, Lindsay told you that I'm an amateur musician. I'm a guitarist. I have 12 guitars at home. And uh, when my son was seven, eight years old, you know, I kept on insisting that he picked one up, you know, so that we could play together. My son was, wasn't interested, you know. He did not want to play the guitar. He didn't want me to teach him. He didn't want somebody else to, but he wasn't interested. He just wanted to play the drums. So, you know, I surrendered, as the Buddhists say, you know. You, 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 well, you can't change, you have to surrender. So, I, I you know, I, I gave up. And then one day, I, I eavesdropped him uh, saying something on a... On the, uh, to his mother, and he was saying, you know, I can't play dad's guitar because you're know, way too big for me. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, you know what I did? I went out, well, I'm sure not the same thing, I went out and I bought a travel guitar, you know, a baby guitar, a pretty good guitar, but, you know, considerably smaller than the ones I usually play. And I, I bought it, and I, without saying anything to anybody, without making big announcements, okay, and I hung it up on the wall next to mom. Next thing that happens, my son is reaching with that guitar and he starts strumming it. Okay, he didn't know how to play. Okay, and uh, and then he asked me if I could teach him. And my son has been playing the guitar ever since. I didn't know then, but I was I, I, I know now. What I was actually doing is you know, I was creating an environment that's motivating, a motivating environment, an environment you know, whereby he could actually motivate himself to play the guitar. You know, in English we have a fabulous problem. You know, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, this is actually valid also in, in what we do in the classroom. Okay? So, there's good news and bad news about motivation. And let's start with the bad news. The bad news is, you know, motivation is not a static phenomenon. It's a, it's a dynamic phenomenon. What does that mean? That it changes. Just because you know your students are motivated the first time you meet them, it doesn't mean, unfortunately, that the motivation is going to stay constant, you know, throughout the course. Sometimes, you know, throughout the, throughout the lesson, in fact. Okay? So, which gives us, you know, which makes our job, you know, much more complicated than it really is. That's one thing. So, it's not a linear kind of process, but it's a roller coaster. So, sometimes they're up here, sometimes they're down here. Okay? And you, as a group leader, as a teacher, okay, you should, you should deal with that. Okay? That's the first thing we need to remember about, about motivation. The second thing about motivation is that I don't actually believe you can motivate anybody to do anything for you. So that's it, folks. We can all go home now. <laughs> Except that there is one thing that we, we should do in a classroom.
classroom, and I think that that's why I need to start with my with my uh, with the story. We should create a motivating environment. So in this talk, I'm going to make some. Obviously, you know, I have strong views on this, but I'm not going to make any huge claims. Okay? I don't believe you know, that what I say is necessarily going to be valuable and valid in your teaching practice. Okay? And I don't believe in universal research. There's tons of research on motivation. Okay? There are reams of papers written about students' motivation and a lot, a lot less on teacher motivation. Now, I believe, though, in local solutions. So I asked my students okay, what they thought is a motivating exercise, for example, and what they thought is a demotivating exercise. And so based on the answers that I got from my students, not one, not two, not three, but we're talking about you know, 250. So still not representative of the global population, but it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty consistent chunk. And based on what the students said, you know, I try and elaborate a framework that I've labeled GPS. I'm going to tell you, you know, what, what these letters stand for, and then you know, we're going to try, I'm going to try and illustrate how these can be used and implemented in practice. Okay? First, though, I, I have a quote that I want to share with you. How do do this? Have you ever asked yourself questions like that? Why does method A or B sometimes work so beautifully and other times so poorly? Well, there are many variables. There are many, many different many different reasons for this, okay? But, you know, one of these reasons may well be, okay, the one group who was motivated for that particular activity, interested, engaged, okay? And another group wasn't. This is our Stevic, you know, asking himself the question in 1996. I'm sure you know that everybody in this room sometimes, you know, doubts about it. How is, how is it possible? I did it with group A, and it worked really, really well, and did the same thing, precisely the same thing, step by step, and it didn't work. Well, I'll tell you one thing, perhaps, Say maybe, okay? Maybe the reason why it didn't work the second time is because you did it exactly the same way. <laughs> and because you know, no two people are alike. And so we need it's up to us to adapt to the way that people learn and not the other way around. So it may be that one of the reasons why it really it didn't it didn't take off is because you did exactly the same thing twice and, and, and that's that's what you get. So This is Pitt Carter, okay, this, uh, to, to just, uh, in 1967, okay, this is what he said. Given motivation, it is inevitable, my italics, that a human being will learn a second language if he is exposed to the language data. This is quite a powerful statement to make. If you agree with this, and I happen to agree with him, okay, it just means one thing. The methodology is not that important. I'm sure you know that you all have anecdotal evidence. I'm sure that you all know people you know who taught themselves you know, how to speak English or Spanish or any other second language, you know, and they and they could pass for a native speaker any time. And it didn't depend. They didn't do it because they had a great teacher. They didn't do it because you know they had access you know to all the modern you know uh, technological paraphernalia. They did it because they they had the fire burning inside. I'll introduce you to one I'm one I'm a, a very <coughs> very well respected academic and a friend of mine. She's Polish, okay, and she's pushing 60 now, I think. She could pass for a, na a native any time. She taught herself English because she hated the totalitarian regime. She had to leave that and live for decades. For her, teaching herself English was a way of acquiring a new identity. That was her motivation. Okay? If she was here with me and she started talking to you, you would never guess that she's not a native speaker of the language. She's never been a book. She has now. Okay? But when she taught herself English, she taught herself English listening to the Voice of America and the BBC. And at school, she was fed a diet of listen and repeat behavioristic sort of drills, drills and drills. Audiolingualism, you remember? So how motivating is that? I've come across people in China okay, with fantastic levels of English. People have never left the country. How did they do it? How did they do it? They do it because you know, they wanted to. And so, is this, the only, is, is this the only thing that's important? Well, no, but it seems to me it's pretty high up. Okay? So, I really believe that's true and that's, that's my interest in uh, and that explains my interest in uh, all things motivation. So, the one billion, quite, the one billion dollar question. Are we motivated anyone to learn a language? No, I don't think we can. 
I still don't think we can because it's a very personal process. Either you have it or you don't. And sometimes you, you, you have it and you lose it. However, there is one thing that we can do, which we shouldn't, okay? We can demotivate somebody. <laughs> and that actually happens you know, very often, okay? So, demo demotivation happens when a student is motivated in the first place and we do something totally wrong and we basically, you know, we kill it, okay? And so, we have a lot of power. But the power that we have, we should use it to create a motivating environment. So, what, what's GPS then? G stands for group processes. Okay? So, in essence, in essence, it means creating a, a psychologically safe environment, creating a palpable sense of belonging, creating, you know, making the students bond, okay? making the students get to know each other. Forgetting about the, the lesson, the first couple of times you actually meet a group, I don't even think we should worry about getting <coughs> the students to speak the language. I think you know, we should have a different agenda altogether. We have to get the, the group you know, to form. If we don't have a group, we don't have anything. So, we need, to, we need people you know, to find out more about each other. You know, we, need, we need people you know, to find out you know, what, where the common ground is. This is what social psychologists you know, I, I, they're all material. If you don't believe me, think about this. If you go to a cocktail party that you don't really want to go to, but you have to, okay? You're bored. You stay half an hour, okay? You get it ready to leave, okay? And on the way out, you meet somebody, you strike up a conversation, and you find out that you have common interests. You both play tennis, you're both guitarists, you know, you're, and, so, and all of a sudden you don't want to leave anymore. I'm not talking about man meets woman kind of scenario. Okay, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about finding common ground with a fellow human being. Okay? This is a real, a real serious bonding element that I think you know, we should really zoom in on. So, the first, my, 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 in my opinion, and okay, that's what I do with my students, it all seems to work. Okay, so, the first couple of times that we meet, okay, we, I forget, I don't have a teaching agenda. I don't even know what it is that I'm teaching, except, except that I, I, I put on my, my psychologist and I want everybody to feel comfortable. I work in a country, France, where mistakes are stigmatized. And a lot of people you know, absolutely freeze. You know, they don't talk in class because you know, they, they, have this, they, they, they get paralyzed. You know? What if I make a mistake? Is he going to punish me? Or what if I make a mistake and you know, the student's going to mock me? So in other, way, in other words, they're not in a psychologically safe environment. If I start, if I start the lesson, Okay, without actually making sure that everybody gets rid of that kind of fear, I'm shooting myself in the foot. It's pedagogical suicide. All right? Some people, some people object, oh, well, yeah, but you know, I'm a teacher, I'm not a psychologist. No, sorry. If you talk about motivation, is motivation important for you? Yeah? yeah? So, so you have an interest in psychology. Psychology with a small p, not a therapist, I'm not a shrink. Okay? Not a therapist, but a psychologist, yes. Because I think you know, that we have to be interested in human behavior. Okay? We, we're dealing with people. We're not dealing with furniture. Okay? People have a brain and a heart, and they have emotions, they have all sorts of different baggage that they bring with them you know, when they come to class. You need to know where the students are coming from affectively. And you also need to know about the background. Otherwise, you know, you can't tap into anything and what you teach is bound to fall flat on its face because you didn't have the, you didn't have the right information in the first place. So, this is, what, this is what I mean by group processes. We're going to do a little exercise. Could you take out a piece of paper and a pen, please?
Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read out a few things. Okay? If you think what I say describes who you are, write it down in the first column. If you think what I say doesn't describe who you are, okay, write it in the middle column. If you think that, if you're not sure, sometimes, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, write it in the third column. Okay? Ready? I can't live without my cell phone. I can't live without my cell phone. Is that you? Does that describe who you are? Or perhaps it doesn't? Or perhaps you're not sure? I'm an outdoor, sporty kind of person. An outdoor, outdoor, sporty kind of person. Number three, I'm always late.